As Britain's economists speculate over the prospects of a triple-dip recession, the future looks bleak for those already struggling to make ends meet. Across England, the cost of renting is going up. House repossessions are on the rise, and particularly here in London, more and more people are finding themselves homeless. One path out of that is squatting, but that is now under serious threat. Tens of thousands of people have been squatting in empty buildings across the UK for many, many years. But last year, the government criminalised squatting in residential buildings, and now it's considering doing the same for commercial buildings. Mike Weatherly is a member of Parliament who's been campaigning to make this happen. I'm no fan of empty buildings either, and I think we ought to do various things to encourage empty buildings to put me back into use. What I don't want to see is vulnerable people, and these are often very vulnerable people, drug addicts and alcohol and so on, going into very vulnerable properties. A lot of these properties, commercial ones who have been abandoned, are unsafe, they don't have sanitation, they don't have electricity. The local authorities should be looking after homeless people. Now, some squatters have got nothing to do with homeless. They are, they are basically anarchists who just want to have rent-free accommodation. They're well educated and web savvy. I don't mind people having alternative views on life and they can live the way they want to, but what they can't do is just take what doesn't belong to them and rob people of their own property. It's true that many in Britain do see squatters as a scourge on society that threaten to steal their property and land. It's an image perpetuated by much of the media. So we decided to visit some squats in London and find out what they're like for ourselves. Welcome to one Rochester Square. Rochester Square is nestled in a residential neighbourhood of North London. The rare green space lay unused for years until the squatters arrived six months ago. We've got six rooms in the main area and one room at the back of the kitchen. The kitchen is built in a way that all our water that we use for cleaning our clothes and cleaning our dishes is recycled back around to the toilet and used also as water to flush the toilet, saving about 70 litres a day. And we have a bike workshop where two people who are amateur bike mechanics work on uh, fixing people's bikes and uh, building up new ones from spare parts. When we arrived, there were alcohol bottles, uh, hypodermic needles, there was pornography. So when we came in, we did a lot of cleaning up. We tried to contact the owner, tried to show him what he's done. Unfortunately, he's only wanted to deal with us through his solicitor and hasn't come down to his site to have a look what we've done here, which is a bit unfortunate. If you look up, you can see that most of the wood is rotting and this is what happens if you don't take care of a place. We have to be very careful to uh, separate media scare stories, because there is a campaign of right-wing media vilification, unfortunately, against squatters, <clears throat> from, from the fact. Pete is a master's student and a part-time teacher. He says that all the squatters he knows think carefully before choosing to occupy a space. Squatters tend to go for places which have been left empty for a very long time anyway. And if they find that this place is just a bit, it has just been sold, or if it's to become somebody's home, they're not going to squat it. A, because the legislation which existed even before the new law meant that they would, they would be evicted very rapidly anyway as a consequence. And B, because squatters are not in the business of taking people's homes. They're, they're, they're in the process of putting a temporary shelter over their heads. I, I wonder if, if many landlords didn't just talk to the squatters as rational individuals and they'd be able to see that actually they're, they're, you know, they're not just druggies who are going to tear the place apart. Um, but can actually improve the place. And he says squatters, like wider society, are composed of a diverse range of people. I used to believe that um, squatters were a subculture of people who were anarchists and, and didn't work and all had Mohicans. And, um, and then I learned actually that they're just people and that many of the people who are, um, you know, serving me food in a restaurant, or many people in, in healthcare are squatters. People who are providing essential services are squatters. They're a very diverse range of people. They're just people on low incomes, and they're just finding a solution to the fact that this is an incredibly expensive city to live in, and property ownership is getting more and more concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. London is among the most expensive places to live in the world, 
Anna previously rented a room in private accommodation, but even that cost her half her earnings each month. She now lives in the garden squat. If I'm working and I need to pay a rent, I will use more than 50% of that money to pay the rent, uh, plus uh, feeding, plus transportation, and basically that will mean that I will be living to pay my housing. And I don't believe that that's fair, because housing, foods and health, uh, it's a human right. Uh, so many people without houses, so many houses without people. Why? While filming at the squat, we stumbled into a gathering of neighbourhood residents who'd come to voice their opinions on its use. And we were surprised to find that overall they were supportive of the squatters, telling us the space had previously been a den of crime. If somebody owns land, then what they do with it, and this is a private space, privately owned space, is, you know, it should be a degree up to them. But if, if there's, no action, there's no action taking place and that's continued for a significant number of years, then those decisions need to be made by somebody else who's um, more capable, especially because this is such a significant area of land. We're not talking about a small garden space in the middle of, you know, a few other houses. This is several, maybe even 10,000 square foot in the very centre of a very, very built up area in very central London. There's certain times when I feel very strongly that, you know, squatters shouldn't get into private properties. And there's certain times when I think, go for it. I'm really pleased to see that unused spaces in central London are being used, especially when they're being used as productively as this. Um, however, you know, I've seen people's properties damaged in a number of unpleasant ways by people who don't have the same um, the moral code, I guess. The squatters, however, have been served a notice of eviction. Their efforts to convince the local authorities to buy the land from the landlord so that it can be used by the local community have so far failed. The next squat we went to see was quite different. An industrial building in South London, the Colorama squat was previously a printing workshop. It too lay abandoned for several years until squatters arrived. It now serves as a multi-purpose hall downstairs and accommodation for squatters upstairs. It was like in a really, really kind of bad state. Like it was like a complete wreck when we first moved in. And I came in out on the second day and uh, yeah, it was, took a lot of work to kind of get back up and like, like to make it like livable and also so we could like hold events there. We got a free shop, we like got like free events, free like music, free kind of movies, um, like an info shop, a library for like people who want to read up and access that kind of stuff. And we got like a lot of people from the community turn up. We have like families, there, like kids running around there. We've had, we've had, uh, but we've also get like squatting networks and stuff like that, which is a very broad kind of range of people. But it's like political types, people who are squatting just to have a roof over their head, and it's just like the neighbourhood and all that kind of stuff. Tom was homeless until he found this squat. He says he doesn't want to be dependent on the welfare state and that squatting has given him the motivation and the independence he needs to change his life. And before I came here, I was homeless for eight months, so like, I had nowhere else to live. And I was in, like, and without squatting, I would have, I would have been on the streets. I would have been, yeah, I, I, there was nowhere I could have otherwise lived. And it was, like it's the same with a lot of people here. Like there's, there's people who are squatting out of necessity as well. This place gives you motivation. It, like, I had no motivation. I was, I was homeless because I was like, because of the rent. And this place has given me motivation. This place has given me orders, given, given me structure. Listening to Tom, it's clear that for him, squatting is more than just about necessity. He has some very strong views on what he sees as serious inequality in society. My dad worked 40 odd years in a factory for nothing, had no money whatsoever, worked his entire life, and he was a clever bloke. The, the people who had the privilege, had the ability to go and get that kind of stuff, that's what they were given to them by their, by their birth and all that kind of stuff, by their education. If you can't squat in buildings like this anymore as well, yeah. what, what did, where did that leave you? Uh, either in prison or homeless, basically. We arrived at Colorama on a Thursday when they have their weekly People's Kitchen. They open their doors to the public and provide freshly cooked meals to anyone who comes in. Donations are welcome, but not necessary. So who pays for all this food then, you might wonder. Well, we were invited to meet two squatters just after midnight in sub-zero temperatures to find out. So what's this kind of stuff you're finding? You got some bread. I got a mop. It all looks a bit unhygienic, piling through the bins of a supermarket. But these two have built up experience of where to go and what to look for, and it seems like they're wearing appropriate clothing. 
Some of the food they find is actually quite expensive in the stores, but all of it has been thrown out, even though much of it is still edible. On this night we found plenty of fruit and vegetables, almost too much to carry, in perfect condition. Many squatters live on this supply of food which would otherwise end up in landfill. Another example, they say, of how society is wasting its resources. I think it's totally fine to eat the food we find in the bins because most of it is actually quite nice. You just wash it, chop it up, cook it and it's totally fine to eat. Most employees will understand because they see every day that they have to throw away a vast amount of food and most of them will realise that it's actually it's a really stupid thing to do. You could just give it to people who, need, who are in need of food. Um, but yeah, I mean obviously sometimes they're not allowed to give food to us or sometimes they have to shoo us away, we're not allowed to enter the premises. Yeah, and sometimes they even build like big fences, um, electric wires and put padlocks in front of the bins, all these things just because they don't want people to get fruit. They want, they want people to buy stuff, you know, this is how capitalism works. I think it's such a waste of resources, you know, like throwing food away. We've got one last squat to visit. This is one that critics like Mike Weatherly would possibly approve of. It's based in an abandoned pub in North London. Nathan showed us around. He lives here with up to 16 others, spread across several floors. He says the building has been empty for around 10 years, and although they moved in without asking anyone, when the landlord finally turned up and met them, he was impressed in the way they'd maintained the property and let them stay if they agreed to leave when he wanted it back. Before we moved in, the garden was full of sewage. Um, the, uh, the, the whole place is pretty much like, like derelict. Like, like we've recently redecorated all in here. Um, so it looked nothing like this. It looked, it was a, a real state. You know, we've had to sort out the plumbing. Uh, like clean up. I asked Nathan how he felt about other squatters who occupied buildings against the landlord's wishes and whether he thought they were stealing that property. I don't think it's necessarily stealing because the idea of, of squatting isn't that you nick something from someone. You know, you're not, you're not, you don't want to permanently deprive someone of a place. If a place is empty, you want to be able to utilise it to give other people a home, uh, create more homes, uh, if it genuinely is empty. Uh, so, so I'm not on about uh, going into a building stopping people from you know, uh, you know, doing work on their home or they've just gone on a holiday or they pop to the shops and you're in there because that thing doesn't happen. No one really wants to do that because A, you deprive someone of a home and secondly, you're, you're going to be out on the streets because it's going to get a court order and police are going to drag you out. There's, there are, are obviously people who squat buildings that are in use and I don't think that should be done. Um, but you can do your homework. You can research a building and find out if it is unused and... Uh, the planning permission on it and everything. Um, in the UK there's 700,000 empty properties um, and there's estimated as half a million hidden homeless. Squats seem, are a, a great like social safety net. The fact there's so many vulnerable people in, in squats goes to show uh, how much the system is failing them outside of, the, outside of squat society. I think, I think rather than it, uh, you know, come down on the squatters, maybe it should come down on, on sort of like the inequality within society. There are people in this house who work um, and, yet, and yet still have to squat to be able to get by. Um, uh, more and more people are struggling just to be able to get by because they're paying so much in rent. If the possibility was accessible to, to not squat, I, you know, I think most people would not squat. There isn't a problem when the landlord and the squatters come to an agreement. Yeah. That's probably a way forward. But a lot of the time, you know, when the landlord or the bailiffs come to the victim, the squatters don't let the bailiffs in. You know, they physically stop them from getting in. When, when, you, when someone's come and got bailiffs on you, uh, I think uh, it's come to a point where the, the owner has not engaged with you at all to be able to talk with you to come to an agreement um, and they're forcing you out the property. There's a place just down the road here. It's been empty for, I think, seven years. It's been squatted three or four times and each time they get bailiffs in and evict people and then it stands empty. You're just going to leave the building empty for another five years, can we not just stay in here until you use it and they just force me out the street. You know, uh, I can understand why people would want to resist and, and hold their home. But that's not how supporters of criminalising squatting see it. These buildings aren't being wasted, they belong to somebody. If I don't drive my car for a year, that doesn't give a squatter a right to go and drive my car, or if someone's not doing, using their property which they've bought. So it, it does belong to somebody, and they are stealing something that doesn't belong to them. Anything that they say about making the premises better or improving it is, is, is actually false. They don't run round the hoover before they leave. I've seen open fires and these, they've seen people, some of these buildings destroyed, and uh, there is a lot of drug taking and antisocial behaviour associated with a lot of squats, not all 
squats, but a lot of squats. And if you talk to some of the residents that I do that are around squats, they are very disturbed about the squats. There's late night parties, there's music, there's all sorts of uh, people coming and going through the night, and they don't really like that type of intrusion into their lives. It is true that some squatters occupy buildings or land for political reasons, such as the campaign to stop a new runway at Heathrow Airport, or others who object to the way wealth is distributed and society is organised. But should they be imprisoned for doing so? And as for anti-social squatters... There's, uh, there's a whole range of squatters and squats. Um, just, in a, just in society, you've, you've, got, you've got nice people and you've got dickheads. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the same in, this, in, this, in, in the squat community, you've got the same thing. Um, uh, majority of people are, are quite understanding. Um, whenever anyone goes into a home, they, they, uh, you know, they want to create a home. Uh, they, don't want to, they don't want to go into a place and destroy it because then it's, it's shit to live there. You know, so you obviously want to make it your home to live there. So you want to keep it nice and, 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 and make it comfortable. Um, but then there are other people who, you know, who are party crews and they like to open up a building um, and, uh, and, and throw parties once in a while, you know, and often, sometimes too often. And, you know, but then again, like when I was, when I was a student, I had more complaints from the neighbours when I was a student than, than I do now. Like, um, when you were a student living in rented accommodation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are cases of squats that are bad. It would be absolutely short-sighted of, of me to sit here and say that um, all squatting is good. That's not the case. But there's no evidence to suggest that squatters are any more antisocial than any other sector of the housing population. I've lived in private rented accommodation with incredibly violent antisocial people who take drugs and listen to loud music and are bad neighbours. Uh, many of the, of the most community-minded people I've ever um, known are squatters. The squats we visited certainly seem to be well organised and as far as we could tell responsible within their respective communities but with residential squatting already criminalised with a penalty of up to six months in prison and squatting in commercial buildings probably next, something is going to have to change. The average rent in London is what, over £1,300. Over £1,300. Now there are 80,000 empty buildings in this, pop, in, the, in this city. Many of those are registered in tax havens. We've got lots of companies which are absentee landlords, leaving buildings empty and speculating on them. And that's the crime. The Conservative government has decided to legislate in favour of landlords to the point where it says that the right to own private property, even if you own lots and lots of buildings and keep them empty for 20, 30 years, is so much more important than the human right to have a, a temporary shelter over your head that, that they're willing to throw people who do the latter into prisons. We should do other things to encourage empty properties back into use, but it doesn't mean that we should then say, well, it's a free-for-all for everybody to go and take what doesn't belong to them. Perhaps the most important question is where do these people go next if squatting in empty commercial buildings also becomes a criminal act? Statistics show that 40% of homeless people are squatters at some point. At a time when the government is trying to reduce its welfare budget, the last thing it needs is more people on low or no income joining the queue for housing benefits. Is it en route to scoring an own goal? Hassan Ghani for The Real News, London.